years later. Finally, this thing, after winning all the awards, about eight awards, right? Yep. Uh, right. Including the Los Angeles Motion Picture Festival. Uh, and we went around, played it in all these different cities. And it took us this long. We finally got a deal for ear music put it out. So it's available. There's some available tonight. But it's, uh, as you could see from a fan's point of view, that Alice Cooper situation. <laughs> and, uh, and the other thing that I love about it is you can tell uh, that the band are all still friends and everything. So uh, thank you all for coming. This is a wonderful event and it's a wonderful cause here for this. I mean, you call it a library, but well, this is way more than a library and it's a wonderful thing. Uh, I'm gonna let Steve uh, take over here and, and give you some inside scoop. Steve is the director and editor of this film. Without him, we wouldn't be here. Without, without Dennis's book, we would not be here. Thank you. Steve Gaddy. I can say, I, as, a, as a director, you're only good as the material you're showing. And, and you know, without the band putting on a performance like that, and, uh, there wouldn't be a film. Uh, I, I can tell you, being an arm's reach away from Dennis and Ryan Roxy on that stage, I was running one of the cameras. Uh, it was palpable that we knew it was going to be fun. We were some of six people that knew that Alice was actually going to walk out on stage ahead of time, but we weren't prepared for what they did. And it was palpable. You can see the guys on the stage. It was camaraderie. It was, they were in the pocket. It's like last night was 1974 and they never stopped. And they played, uh, and I'm not, this isn't a bragging point for me or Chris, but it's the best recorded performance of the original group in a live setting. And, to, and 40 years after they split, to do that, is, it's, it's a landmark occurrence. So my hat's off to the band. And furthermore, I gotta highlight where that took place. Every, every town has one record store that you know that the guys that are running it are, are, you know, they're in it for the love of the music. It's not just to make a buck. And that, that store in Dallas is Good Records. And uh, that's the reason things like this happen there. It's legendary. And, uh, and the, the guy that makes it work, the guy that makes it take the heart of Good Records is Chris Penn. And he jumped through hoops of fire to make this happen. I mean, it's crazy what he did to make this happen. That's the other half of the movie, you know? It's, it's the band giving to the fans, but in this case, the, the super fan gave the band their identity back. Alice Cooper, everybody knows the name Alice Cooper, but Alice Cooper started out as five guys, not just one. And to this day, a good fraction of his live set, like, like about a third of it at least, came from Dennis, Glenn, Michael Bruce, and Neil Smith. And uh, without that, the show wouldn't be what it is now, which, which is great, but... Uh, but man, thank God for the Alice Cooper group. And thank God for record store owners and super fans like Chris Penn. All right, all right, I'm gonna eat the mic. I'm gonna keep it brief. Thanks for coming out on a school night. Thanks to Westport Library. Thanks to uh, Verso Studios who are recording records here and putting out records. And this place is amazing. Thanks to uh, Beehive, Christine Ullman. Thanks to Jennifer Bangser. There's so many people to thank. Uh, but uh, there's so many layers to this film and so many layers to music. And what, to me, music means is uh, it uh, gets you through some difficult times. It gets you through happy, sad times. And But there's a backstory to everything, and there's stuff that you just don't share. But... What's really been amazing about this is the community of fans and friends, and and uh, I've got just some some new lifelong buddies and uh, people that mean so much to me, and it's uh, amazing. And I hope it it trans the it came through th with the movie, like what music means to me and what music means to you guys. You guys are here on a Sunday at friggin' eight o'clock in Westport, Connecticut. And this was seven years ago. It'll be eight years in October. And when it's 10 years old, we're going to do a big celebration. We don't know where yet. Probably in Canada at the, at the Paul Brennan Historian's House basement. He's, 
He's going to have an, a, a permanent Alice Cooper Museum. If you guys saw the museum tonight, that was Dennis Dunaway and Paul Britton's concoction. And that's just 5% of what they have. They're hoarders. They got a problem. They got a situation. But anyway, I won't take up any further. Thank you very much. And if you, ha you can take the film home with you over there. I'm going to sell it. Dennis will sign it. He's signing books. All the books benefit the Westport Library. All the money goes to those guys. And $19 with an autograph, you got to do it. Our goal is to sell them out. We have 30 of them. I want to sell them out to benefit the library because they brought us here and they made this happen. So we're going to open up questions. Right over there, there's a, a right, Jennifer Bangzer, right. amazing human. That's where you go, a spotlight. Hey. Thank you, Jennifer. All we need is Thank a you. disco ball. So go over and see Jennifer. <laughs> if you have a question, you want to know something, right here. only ask us Alice Cooper or rock and roll related questions. I can't help you with your physics homework, your trigonometry. Ask Cindy Dunaway to spell trigonometry and we can talk about it. But so go see Jennifer. If not, we'll go over there and sign books and sign albums. We gotta sell out the albums. We got about 10 albums. And we got about 30 books, and it all benefits the library. So go see us over there. Jennifer, open it up. Dennis's book, buy it now. Come on over. Uh, questions? Oh, get ready. All right. I need one day of rest. <laughs> and on the eighth day, oh, God no created <laughs> the follow up to muscle love. Bodies need rest. Questions? When you, when you ask the question, stay your name and where you're from, because we want to know where you came from. Uh, Brendan Toller Verso Studios. <laughs> what city is that? Westport, Connecticut. He's a hometowner. He's a townie. Um, I'm a filmmaker. I've been in music my whole life. What's coming through this film is it's the complete marriage of fans and Dennis, your generosity, your and Cindy's generosity. They were here all weekend with the museum. The Blue Coop performed here. That is seeping through this film. I want to hear from Chris and I want to hear from Steve what this was like, this whole process. It's in the film, but I want to hear more. Well, I'll start out and I'll hand it to Steve. So what's really weird about this film, there's so many it's like an onion. There's multi-layers. You'll cry, you'll laugh, you'll have heartburn. But right before we started, I, there was a thing called Periscope. It doesn't even exist anymore. You, you guys know what Periscope is? So right before we went to film, I, I told the guys, like, there's this thing called Periscope. We need to go live for the people that couldn't be here. So that evening and later on and, and the next day, it picked up and it was like wildfire. Renee and Chelsea's, which is Dennis and Cindy's daughter, messaged him and what did you guys do in Dallas? They thought it was just another whatever. But people were in London, Japan, Tokyo, picked it up, it, was, it went viral. And uh, it was, that was what, that's what made this happen, it's just, but it all stemmed from Dennis's book, Snakes, Guillotines, and Electric Chairs. And this guy has a memory like a elephant. I guess they have good memories. I don't know how you know that, but anyway. But it meant a lot to me. I didn't care if anybody was in the room. I just wanted those three guys, and then we got the fourth guy, Alice. Well, I just wanted Dennis. If he signed his book with nobody else, I wouldn't have cared. But when we did this film, a day before, I said, I, I, buddies, hey, you got a camera? Come on out. So we had five to seven cameras. Steve can elaborate further to the specifics. And Steve kind of became the director. And we had a, about a three-minute meeting in the parking lot. You film Alice. You film Neil. You film Michael. You know, you film Dennis. And, but anyway, everybody filmed Alice. But it was so close in proximity, it didn't matter. But you look at those smiles on their faces, that's genuine. They're having fun, cutting up, and the songs are so great. Nobody cares, you chopping babies or whatever. <laughs> it's great music, and that's what just ruddered home. So Steve, do you have anything to elaborate? What was the question again? 
What did it mean to us? What was the process like? We're, we've been here eight years later. Eight years in October, it'll be an anniversary. Continue, Steve. We could make a movie on like everything that's happened around the movie, from the making of it to like like touring around with it. I have made some lifelong friends now with the Dunaways, especially. I mean, they they have gone above and beyond to champion this film, and and I, I consider them family now. So, thank you. <laughs> but. The, the process, yeah, it was, it was a call from Chris. You know, I, I knew he had this thing, you know, he, he's, his favorite band of the world was Alice Cooper, the band. And he had Dennis coming in for a, uh, for a book signing. It was blowing up. It was like, well, he might get some of the other guys here. And then I get a phone call. I'm trying to get Alice. Don't tell anybody. And then the day before, Alice is going to be here. Make sure you get the damn cameras here. So we did that. And... Like I had mentioned before, you know, we were no, we knew we were in for something really, really special, but it, it just freaking melted our faces what happened. And I was looking at it. If you time it out, it's pretty much exactly 40 minutes for the set. Kind of short. But longest we, since 1974. Longest in since Brazil, 1974. And which was more the than biggest we count. show. Yeah. So um, I'm thinking 40 minutes is not a movie, but the story about how this happened, because I knew this. He did literally cut out, illegally cut a hole in the back of his store to some property he didn't have rights to behind him. It wasn't in the exact spot you see in the movie, but it was the, it was the right idea. And um, it's just the, the things this guy goes through to pull off stuff like that is, is, is just amazing. And I was like, I know this story. It's as good as the show. No disrespect, but it is. And so I say, between telling your story, showing the whole live performance, we got a movie. And he just said, Dennis, take it. Yeah, yeah. I, I just thought of something. So we're doing film festivals, and there's uh, several directors. And somebody asked one of the directors, how long did it take you to film this? And they said something like four years. And they asked Steve, how long did it take you to film your movie? And he said, about 35 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, 50 minutes pre-production and then, you know, 40 minutes set. The, the drone shot you see coming down, that was a guy that works for Southwest Airlines. He was just there. He brought a drone. It was not planned. It was the, the news, news piece you see in there, like they picked it up and the next, there was uh, the show and then the day off where we did this thing and then they opened up for Alice Cooper and uh, they opened up for Molly Crew, sorry. And they're there, and they finish it out, and they, the original band comes out and does Schools Out. And I was down front, and the security guards are trying to kick me out. That's how much I love these guys. And I'm like, I snuck down with my, my Alice Cooper all-access pass. Get out of here. Pink like, pants, he's hard to miss. See, these guys are just doing this one song. But it's just, it's a labor of love, and I hope you guys get that. And it's genuine. There's no pretense. And... That's, I think, the universe is working for us, and we just got stuff to, it's just, it's going. It's really very special. We got a next question? Hello, my name is Dimitri Santa Maria, and I'm from Norwalk, Connecticut. This is actually a two-parter question. First one's easy. Dennis, what's your favorite bass guitar? Well, the, the bass I was playing in the movie, the one that was on display the last couple of days, my billion-dollar bass, 1970 Fender bass, I actually was in the studio and I had a problem with the bass that I had brought in. So I rented that bass for the Killer album. And what, what year was that, boys? Well, it, was, it came out in 71, so you probably okay. recorded 70 maybe. Um, probably 1970. And I rented that bass and by the time I got done renting it, the rental was way more than the, the actual cost of the bass, so it was mine. And I've had it ever since and that's my baby, but I, I have uh, several bases, and I love them all, but that one's my fave. Uh, the second part is, what techniques do you use to keep conti listeners continuously engaged? <laughs> Prayer. <laughs> and I could... uh, it's a collaboration. I mean, it, it's like the film. You know, you, you look at it, and, and you think, well, this works, and wait a minute, this doesn't quite work, so let's fix that. And, you know, there's a lot of rat in the maze kind of a thing where you keep, keep uh, you know, art is, is creating 
until it's done, and then you stop. Knowing when to stop is also a big part of it, but the Alice Cooper group didn't have that much of a problem with when to stop because doing two albums a year, you didn't have much time for any excessive uh, uh, behavior. Hey, Dennis, it's Mike Graff, Norwalk. How much of a role did Bob Ezrin play in the making of albums like uh, Welcome to My Nightmare, School's Out, because those albums, when you put that needle down, they're still relevant today, and it's like cuts through, and they're just so perfect. Well, do you know who makes that? Bob Ezrin makes that. He's a big chunk of this. And what's really weird, he was the gatekeeper. Shep Gordon said, is this any good? And Bob Ezrin said, okay. it's fucking good. And he's like, they, those guys were on point that night. So Bob Ezrin, you know, he wasn't on the first two, and he wasn't on the last one, but he's come back in the mix, and he got, got this to happen. So he's pretty monumental in a lot of Alice Cooper. He's the George Martin, but Dennis, continue. I just want We didn't give him props, and Justin okay. Cordy, who mixed that. No, that's good. Without Bob Ezrin, this wouldn't exist. Friggin' The Wall, Destroyer, Peter exactly. Gabriel. Yeah, but anyway, Dennis, continue. Well, well, the Alice Cooper group were all very collaborative, and... We were all a bazillion ideas, and we had a rule that uh, since there were five band members, we had a rule that you couldn't throw out an idea until you gave it a heartfelt try. And then we would vote, and then the majority won. And that was the end of it, no grudges or anything. We'd move forward. And uh, that worked for us for a lot of years. It was time consuming. But uh, I think because of that, we came up with the best ideas. Now, here comes Bob Ezrin into this sacred rehearsal room. And the first thing that had to happen is he had to be baptized by the fire of Glenn Buxton's sarcasm. Because we people that didn't know us thought, oh, God, these guys hate each other. But back in high school, we used put-down humor, you know, and... We would fire all kinds of wisecracks. If, if I left the room, I knew they were whittling me to pieces before <laughs> until I got back, and then it would be my turn on somebody else. All of that humor, uh, which a lot of books don't depict that because sarcasm doesn't, it's hard to write about sarcasm unless you specify that that's what was going on. Bob Ezrin comes in the studio the very first day Glenn Buxton fires off a couple. Bob Ezrin held his own. He, nobody could beat Glenn Buxton at a, a you know, a sarcastic wit contest. But, uh, but he stood his ground. Okay, he's in. Now, what he brought to the table was the ability to uh, make a song ready for AM radio, because we had a lot of sprawling. I'm 18, it's the very first song we, we talked about. This is a perfect example, actually. Yeah. I'm 18, had this sprawling, slow, moody, bluesy intro that kept slowly building, slowly building, and then all of a sudden, it would kick in. And then once it kicked in, it ha uh, had a long outro where we were really milking it. Well. You know, we come in the studio, very first song we worked on together, Bob says, cut out the intro. And we're all like, Bob, but we like the intro. <laughs> he says, cut out the intro. We're going to start with the chorus instrumentally and then go right to the verse. And not only that, but now we're also going to take it down to just the bass and drums. Oh, wait a minute, Dennis, you're playing a note that conflicts with the bass drum there. Neil, you're playing something that can play. Okay, we learned how to take a song, dissect it, take it completely apart, and make sure that everything worked together. And we were sponges. Everything, like anything musical, that uh, would help what we wanted to do, we we soaked it up really fast. So it, uh, Bob brought this enthusiasm and this clarity. We had a tape recorder, but we couldn't afford tape. So we'd come back the next day and go, what did we do yesterday? And by the time we started trying to remember, it would change to something else. And Bob would say, no, that's not what you were doing. You were, it was, you know, Neil, you were playing this beat, not that beat. 
And so he was kind of like our tape recorder because he had this amazing, still does, amazing memory for that. And he also had the ability to make snap decisions to keep things moving forward. So instead of spending an entire day on the outro of, a, of the ending of a song, he would help us focus. But the great thing is he would let me and Neil do all kinds of experimentation to come up with the parts that we felt were the best. And once they would lock in, then then they would lock in, and that's how they stayed to this day. Even the parts Neil plays in, in the movie and the parts I play are pretty much the same as when they locked in back then. So Bob had that extra clarity to what we were doing. Exactly, exactly. Thanks. I would add that uh, um, one of my favorite bands is Pink Floyd, and, and, and The Wall had a big influence on me. So. To, to have Bob Ezrin's name in the opening credits as sound mixer when his previous feature that he put out as sound mixer was Pink Floyd the Wall, put me over the moon. Jennifer, Jennifer how many more questions do we have? One. That's it? So Time for one, and then we've got books on right. so. it. All right, there's one, but does anybody want to be the second? Did anybody got some pressing? Or either, otherwise, turn off your cell phone. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So this is the last question, unless you want to... Right. All right. Make it good. This is the this is the last question, Robert Gagne. But all right, and that's it. And we're gonna sign over there. It all benefits the library. Come see us. We're gonna sell out the books, sell out the records. Two questions left. Hey, Dennis. Jim Muth. I'm from Tallinn, Connecticut. Fellow bass player as well. Uh, Dennis. So first off, kudos to for remembering all of the stories from the '70s. I don't know how you did it, <laughs> living through the '70s. But great book. One question, uh, and again, as a fellow bass player and uh, musician, what made you think of uh, writing Under My Wheels, Under a Couch? <laughs> awesome. awesome. Oh, my God. Neil always talks about that because uh, we were in a hotel uh, like we pretty much lived in, either a station wagon or a hotel in those days. And I think it was Rochester or Buffalo, somewhere up there. And we were in the hotel, and of course, we always had a bunch of people in the room and a lot of distractions. And so I'm trying to show uh, Michael the chords. And so we tipped this big couch forward, so then it was kind of a fort that we could climb inside and then play in there and kind of block out all the commotion. But then uh, everybody went out. They went to dinner or went to a party or something. I can't remember what. But uh, then Neil's saying, we go out and we're gone for hours and we come back and they're still under the couch. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just uh, trying to escape uh, distractions mostly. Necessity. It's Wait like a little, <laughs> little like a little kid in, under your... Uh, blanket at night, you know, with your little flashlight and your comic book. <laughs> Last one. Come see us over there in a minute. Hey, guys. I'm Mark from Stamford, Connecticut. Um, my question is for Dennis. So could you tell us the process of deciding which songs got played that night and what was the back and forth and how those uh, songs Dennis, let me take decided. this real quick. So he might, he might give you the, I'm going to give you a behind the scenes answer. He was a little perturbed, so he made the set list extra long. He goes, I'm kind of mad about something. So Alice showed up. The songs are just there. No rehearsal before, the night before. And he could probably give you, some, maybe he won't give you the real insight, but he's like, I'm going to make it extra long. I was like, fuck yeah, you are. Let's do it. And... They played seven songs, and they went back in there and did an on. And they said, "What are we gonna do an encore?" And I come, I go, "Desperado," because they tested the instruments the night before and the gear, and they ran through that. And Michael sang it, and because yeah, I think it was not what night. What's the song called? Night, night. night. Yeah. So, but we pulled Michael's vocals out, and the, the Desperado they rehearsed the night before is the intro music that the local animator animated. And I went back there and super fan. 
Y'all play Desperado, and Neil Smith goes, nope. <laughs> but they decided, I think, was it Neil that said elected? Who, who decided on elected? No, that was Ryan Roxy but twisting all of our arms to do uh, elected. And we're like, well, we none of us have played that for in forever, you know? But, but why did y'all make, one, I'll get back to his question. Why did you make it so long? And then before elected kicked in, or when it was in the middle of the song, then Neil was like, I didn't know how to fuck, I didn't know what fucking song we we're playing. Well, well, yeah. So you're talking about the set for the film, or yes, just yes. general? Okay. The, song, the songs that we uh, sang. Yeah, so, so uh, Ryan said, okay, you got to do elected. We got to do it, you know, and we're like, oh, my gosh, really? Let me see, how did that go again? And. And so we go, okay, and we're talking about it. You know, let me see here, okay, I think I got it, I think I got it, but let's go anyway. And we went back, because we didn't realize we were making a film, which was probably a good thing, because we might have been trying to, you know, show off more. Michael still doesn't know. Uh, but uh, so, so this is what happened. After we played Elected and got backstage again, Neil said exactly what I was thinking at the same time on stage. Michael hit the first chord, and then Neil said to himself, what the heck comes next? <laughs> but then Michael played the riff, and then, oh, okay, oh yeah, okay. You can hear his, Neil's bass drum kicks in. There's just a fraction of a hesitation there, and then he comes in. <laughs> Why did you pick those songs? Uh, the, the songs, well, okay, no rehearsal. We hadn't played together in so many years. Mm -hmm. So we chose pretty much the songs that, uh, that most of us in our various bands that we're in uh, were mo most familiar with, rather than deep cuts where I might play one in my band and, and Neil might play one, a different one in his band. And, and the other uh, thing that I might say about this that's, uh, you know, you got to pat Al uh, Alice on the back because he's talking about being in four different bands. And he's also mentioned that there are different arrangements of our songs and different uh, interpretations of our songs. And for him to all of a sudden, Forget that, that he's done night after night. The, you get to a part of schools out even and where they would go into uh, another brick in the wall. You know, he still managed to maintain uh, being true to this without all of a sudden slipping into what he's used to doing night after night automatically. Mm -hmm. And about Alice's vocals, first of all, he didn't know what he was playing till he stepped out on stage and looked down at the set list. Second, um, there's a little trick that a lot of bands do as the singer's getting older. Sometimes it's harder to hit the same range. And so they'll drop a key a little bit. Most people won't notice it. You know, a few people that are very, you know, play by ear, they'll, they'll, they'll catch on to it. And this has happened over the years with Alice's current touring band. Everybody does that. Yeah, this is, this is not a secret. This is, you know, and it's how they continue to perform on top level. Um, well, if you're not singing, it takes no more effort as you get older to play the same notes on your guitar. So the original band still playing in the same key. Uh, Ryan Roxy, of course, is very adept at like, oh, we're doing it in this key. Okay. Alice comes out. He's got to sing in a key that he hasn't been used to singing to in quite some time. And uh, at the premiere in, in Phoenix, Toby Mamis sat next to me and then at some point he leaned over to me and was like, I have not heard Alice this good in decades. And the reason was the band was playing in the original key. They hadn't even thought to drop it for Alice and he met it. He got there and that passion and that gusto was in his voice like, it's, like it hasn't been in so long. And I, I feel like that's a lot of the magic that's in this movie. Yeah. It's, uh, so instead of playing 18 in the key of E minor, it was in E flat minor. So they would tune they would tune their guitars lower so that the highest note isn't quite as high. I see. But you know, that's doing two hour sets every night, and that's why you do that. And here we are, well, we're only doing four or five songs or whatever, so let's tune up the pitch. But we surprised Alice, but because of that, it's more rock and roll gutsy. <laughs> Amen.
Thank you, everybody. And th thanks to Westport Library. Thank you. This is the coolest library I've been in. Thank you. Photo. Wild Bill. Photo. Wild Bill. Come see us over there. We're going to sell out the book.